Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship. Uh, as we know, today is Father's Day. Mark Twain once said that when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have him around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the man had learned in seven years. Both parenting and fatherhood can be a real trial and yet be a very real blessing. I'm grateful that I have my father in heaven, my holy God, and my biological father in heaven. Obviously, God is our first and foremost father to be praised and remembered today. But I pray for all of you, whether your father is still here with you or has passed on into the next realm of life, that you have a wonderful day celebrating you as a father of somebody. Would you please join us in the responsive call to worship? The sun shines more brightly. Its warmth stays with us for so many more hours. So we shake free of our routines. In this new moment, we wander about the wilderness, hoping God will open our eyes, praying God will make us worthy, wanting to grow with God, let us grow together in the wild ways of our God. So our first hymn this morning is Praise to the Lord Almighty. So would you please join us in singing this hymn? Unison prayer of invocation. Wild God, you do great and wonderful things for all creation. It makes what there is nothing else in the world like you or that can replace you. There's nothing else like your love and mercy. Wild God, come and worship with us. Help us to grow in your love. This we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not, not into, into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. evil. For thine, thine is, the, is kingdom the kingdom and the power, the power and the glory, glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So this morning's message for the young at heart um, starts out with talking about hobbies. What are some of the hobbies that you or others in your family might enjoy? Reading, knitting, and photography are popular hobbies. Some people like to build things like model cars or airplanes. Others may enjoy the outdoors, activities like fishing and hiking. Grace, do you have a favorite hobby that you enjoy? I think playing the piano. Playing the piano, fun. I wonder if God has a favorite hobby. Okay, I know that the Bible doesn't tell us that God has a hobby, but if he did, do you know what I think it might be? Bird watching. Oh. If I use my imagination, I can see God sitting in heaven with a pair of binoculars. And perhaps he has a book with pictures of all the beautiful birds, just such as I have here, that he's created. And he's trying to see how many of them he can find with his binoculars. And if I really stretch my imagination, I can even hear him saying, there's a bluebird. Oh, look, a cardinal. There's an eagle, a meadowlark, a loon and a sparrow. Of course, he would see a sparrow because there's lots of them in the woods. There's song sparrow. Did you know that the song sparrow is the most common and widespread sparrow that's native to North America, which is where we live? The most northern song sparrows are large and darker, quite different from the song sparrows that we would see uh, in our parks and on our lawns. Although the song sparrows learn their music from other song sparrows, each bird creates its own variation. No two birds sing the same tune. I did not know that. That helps to explain why I have a hard time sometimes identifying the birds in the woods, perhaps. <laughs> One day, um, you know, Jesus uh, was teaching his disciples that they shouldn't be afraid. And Jesus said to them, don't be afraid when people threaten you. Two sparrows are sold for a penny, but not a single sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing it. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. A sparrow seems to us like a common bird. It's been said that God must have loved the ordinary and common people because he made so many of us. But see, I don't think that God sees us or the sparrows as common or as ordinary. If he did, he would have made us all look alike and he wouldn't have given each of us special gifts and talents. If God thought we were just ordinary and common, he wouldn't love us in such an uncommon and an extraordinary way. The Bible says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. We are more precious to him than a whole flock of sparrows. And we know how much he loves the sparrow. Grace and I want to sing to you a little song this morning. It's called, He Cares for You and Me. If he cares about the lamb who's gone astray, if he helps the cricket somehow find his way, he sees the turtle go inside his shell. Oh, 
Dear God, we know that we are precious in your sight. We thank you for loving us with such an uncommon and ordinary love. In Jesus' name, amen. The Union Psalter reading, Psalm 86, verses 1 through 10 and 16 through 17. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guide my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant, trust in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your children, Lord. Look, I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you, because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servants. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For well, you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The invitation of offering. Our wild God has helped and comforted us, and it is so good. We will not be distressed, not anymore. We will work in this goodness to mend every broken branch on our family tree. We'll, we will use our spiritual gifts, tithes, and offerings to rebuild the body of Christ. Let us give to the family that nurtures us in new growth. The church leadership deeply appreciates your giving to our local communities and also expresses heartfelt thanks to all for sending in your financial gifts and pledges. Your support during this time is greatly appreciated. Members and friends of Green Mill Union may continue to send offering and pledges to the church at P.O. Box 368, Greenville, Maine, 04441. Members and friends of the Rockwood Community Church may send offering and pledges to P.O. Box 84, Rockwood, Maine, 04478. Thank you. Would you please join me in the unison prayer of dedication? Grow these gifts in your love, wild God. Bless our offerings, our hearts, and our hopes in your love to make us worthy of your work in this world. Fill these gifts and each of us with your goodness. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is one, the tune is very familiar to us. Three of the verses you may recognize. Two of them, the second and third one that we'll be singing, are taken from uh, the uh, Believer's Portal. Uh, this hymn, believe it or not, actually has like 10 stanzas to it, uh, which I did not know. Uh, so anyway, we're going to sing five of them this morning, and so please join us. <clears throat> Thank you. 
The scripture this morning is from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He sent them on, he set them on her shoulders and sent, and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Besheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And then, and as she sat there, the child began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Thank you folks for participating in the service readings this morning. Have you ever thought to yourself that some things in our world just ought not to happen? Brianna Taylor, a 26-year-old EMT, was lying in her bed asleep with her partner in Kentucky when all of a sudden, thinking they were being burglarized, their apartment was raided by plainclothes policemen executing a no-knock search warrant. Her partner, with a legal license to carry, shot his gun, and within minutes, she was dead, having been shot by eight of the 20 blind shots into the apartment. The police were looking for someone who lived 10 miles away and was already in police custody. Their cause, they had seen her car in the neighborhood of the person that they were looking for. Her partner was arrested on assault and attempted murder of a police officer. Those charges still penned. Ahmad Aubrey, a 25-year-old, was killed in Georgia while out jogging in his middle-class neighborhood, monitored by two armed white men with shotguns, killed and left for dead. It took two months before video footage emerged of the killing by a third suspect, 
at which time the local prosecutor on the case had to recuse himself, citing issues of conflict of interest. George Floyd, a 46-year-old in Minnesota, while under arrest for an alleged charge of using a counterfeit $20 bill to purchase a pack of cigarettes at the local convenience store, was brutally murdered by those three officers. As a result, an uprising goes viral across our nation, protests in the streets of many of our major cities, some out of control and destruction left in its path. And just not African Americans participating, people of every ethnicity appear to be taking an active part in this uprising. And now, a fear of the coronavirus being spread in cases rapidly rising, potentially overwhelming healthcare resources, and adding to the already brokenness of our economic system. Our history is being erased as monuments are deliberately removed and destroyed. I know, everyone is tired of hearing about it tired of listening and seeing it all over the media. We all have our individual views and opinions and prejudices. We live in rural Maine, the Northern state of New England. This doesn't affect me, they say. They don't live here. I have nothing to do with this until someone drives home one night after work and not just any night, it happens to be Juneteenth the holiday that celebrates the emancipation, emancipation of slaves and specifically the day that the last of the slaves were freed in 1865. Juneteenth, and in the glow of the sunset, Mina Matthews takes in a noose that has been hung from the power line in front of her in a small coastal town named Deer Isle with a population of about 2,000 people. Mattis reports, if you drive onto the island tonight, you saw against this against the sunset, a noose hanging from the power lines next to a huge White Lives Matter sign. Just this morning, less than a mile away, Black Lives Matter signs had not only been up a few hours and were vandalized and torn down. Over the past few weeks, dozens of local BIPOC have met at protests and have told me about the harassment, the violent assaults and exclusion they've faced right here in our own community. I've even had a Confederate flag waved in my face right in front of the Blue Hill Town Hall. A man shouted at me that we should put them all in cages. Tell me again, this isn't our problem, that it doesn't happen here. By the way, does, do you know what BIPOC stands for? Black, Indigenous, and or people of color. This particular acronym was created to acknowledge Black and Indigenous people who have historically been the most marginalized culture in our nation. This very nation that states in the preamble to the Constitution, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. I know everyone is tired of hearing about it tired of listening and seeing it all over the media. We all have our individual view, views and opinions and prejudices. I have to tell you, I've learned more Black history, Black American history, in the past few months than I have in my whole 60 years of living. And shame on me is what I say. And have I, I have had to sit back and acknowledge even that Jesus was delivered by a woman of Middle Eastern culture, dark skin, brown eyes, dark hair. He lived and ministered and taught in the Middle East, offered hope and wisdom and love and grace in the Middle East. 
And throughout the centuries, he has been portrayed as many want to view him. Lily white skin with blue eyes and light brown blondish hair. And what would Jesus have to say about all this? These events are what are occupying the news right now. And the other things that ought not to happen have been pushed underground, I guess. Our nation's landscape right now is a deep burning pit of hell. And I believe that God is very, very angry and sad and sorrowful and baffled and heartbroken. In the Gettysburg Address of 1863, President Lincoln stressed that the U.S. Constitution should be seen and interpreted with this statement and ideology in mind, a moral standard of which this nation should strive. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing about it, but there are many out in our world who see that things like this ought not to happen. And yet many somehow close their eyes and shut down their hearts to the reality around them. I dare say we all have at one time or another closed our eyes and shut down our hearts to the realities we live with every single day. I tend to take these things very seriously and perhaps too much so. Being Judeo-Christian, my best friend in the entire earth, being a black man raised in Tallahassee, Florida, and a connection to our native indigenous peoples, I have grown to feel the things that just ought not to happen in a very deeply personal, emotional, and spiritual way. And I believe that all people on earth are created by and of the same spirit as I am. Although we as a privileged people of this nation have worked very hard to crush that spirit in certain populations. Our scripture lesson this morning plays out a situation where we are reminded of how some things that seem like great ideas can quickly become situations that just not ought to have happened. Abraham and Sarah had no children, and yet God had promised to make of their descendants a great nation. They had hung all their hopes upon that promise, but God had not yet given them any children, and they were getting old. And they were getting worried about whether or not there would be a fulfillment of that dream around which they had planned their lives. Instead of just trusting God to do what God had promised, Sarah decides to do something about it. And so she took her Egyptian maid, Hagar, and gave her to Abraham to be his wife so that she could have a baby for them. In their culture, that was an acceptable thing to do. But when Sarah had to deal with the reality of her decision, what happened? A deep jealousy began to unfold and to be played out. Sarah began to blame Hagar and to misuse her, causing Hagar to run away. But God sent a message to Hagar telling her to return to Abraham and Sarah, and that in the midst of her misery, God had heard her cry. And God promised that he would increase her descendants, that they would also become too numerous to count. Ishmael was born, and it appears that everyone was happy. That is, until Sarah birthed Isaac. It didn't take very long for Hagar and her son to become a little arrogant and patronizing with Sarah. And eventually, Sarah demanded that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. It didn't seem to matter to her that she would be sending Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert to die. Now, Abraham found himself to be in a very difficult situation. Both boys were his sons, and he loved them dearly. 
but jealousy and the tendency always to live in competition decreed that one of Abraham's sons was destined to be the chosen one and one was to be the outcast. While I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to take a course on the history of the indigenous native peoples of this nation's soil. It included a short, intensive immersion on the Penobscot Reservation. Recently, Molly Neptune Parker, known for her incredible basket weaving, passed away. I had the privilege of meeting her as I met several from the Neptune family, all very creative and artistic people. In the fall of 2007, still in seminary, I took a trip for 10 days out to the Cheyenne River Reservation, one of the five Lakota Sioux reservations in South Dakota. An acquaintance of mine, the CEO at Hancock Lumber Company in Casco, Maine, Kevin Hancock, has also spent a great deal of time on the Pine Ridge Reservation out there. In fact, I recommend his book titled Not for Sale, Finding Center in the Land of Crazy Horse. In my experiences, I have learned a lot of American history that I was never taught in all of my years of school. I have read a lot of excerpts from government documents that I never knew existed, much less thought I would ever find myself reading. And I must admit, I have cried many tears that I had not anticipated crying. There are many treaties that we entered into, they entered into in good faith, of which we have yet to fulfill. Some things that happen in our world really just ought not to happen. I came across a brief article this week titled Black Catholic Spirituality, Full of the Spirit, posted by C. Vanessa White, in which she states, Black people are a spirit-filled people. It transcends regional differences and socioeconomic backgrounds. It is our sense of this spirit that has helped us to survive centuries of oppression, alienation, flogging, lynching, discrimination, murder, and human devaluation. To understand us, one must understand our spirituality, which has African roots. The ways of searching for God and experiencing God's presence in our lives is done in a cultural context. Black spirituality, the late sister Thea Bowman said, is a response to and a reflection on black life and culture. It is rooted in our African heritage and is colored by our middle passage from Africa to America, slavery, and our Caribbean and Latin experience, segregation, integration, and our ongoing struggle for liberation. I am reminded lately that these people did not ask to come to this nation. They were illegally captured, trafficked, and sold off against their will, and then brainwashed and demoralized to keep them subservient to their masters. I know that we here today had no part in this, but we do have a part in our own prejudices and biases and ongoing mistreatment of people. Do we ourselves act right and call others to be and to do right? Or do we participate and or just close our eyes and our hearts to it? I'd like to suggest today that we are challenged in our individual faith, in our churches and in our denominations today to look at and to question and struggle with the realities of our world today. Wherever people believe that they must live in competition with each other, one is almost sure to fall into the role of the chosen, the advantaged, and the other will fall into the role of the disadvantaged, the outcast. If we studied the human situations in which we are familiar with, we most likely could easily pick out the chosen ones from the outcast. 
who are the advantaged and who are the disadvantaged, even our, in our own families, in our schools, where we work, in the communities where we live, and in each nation, even in the community of nations. At each of these levels, we can see that there are outcasts who are struggling to push themselves in and to make a place for themselves. We can see how the advantaged feel threatened by this and react by defending their stakes. We can see how the conflicts keep developing. Both the chosen and the outcasts think they know the solution to the problem. The chosen think that they must protect their advantage by either eliminating or subjugating the outcasts. The outcasts often think that their only hope is to push themselves into the position of the advantaged and to push the chosen into the position of the outcast. Those dynamics explain an awful lot of the things that ought not to happen in our world. Our scripture lesson this morning gives us some insight into the dynamics of what may be happening when those things that ought not to happen do indeed happen. And it gives us some insight into what the solution may be. This story does that by showing us the realities of human existence and the steadfast presence and guidance of a sovereign God. People like Abraham and Sarah, Hagar, they were all very human and God had to work with them in terms of their humanity. In the sad story of Ishmael and Isaac, God has another solution in mind. Even though God told Abraham that he was going to have to accommodate the jealousy of Sarah, it's clear that God truly loved both Ishmael and Isaac. Despite the fact that Ishmael was a child of his parents' unfaith, he has a place in the love of God. God desires that there be a place for him in the world, and he promises to also make him into a great nation. God wants there to be a solution to the world's problems in which both sides are affirmed and in which the well being and human dignity of both are provided for. One in which both not only respect one another, but work together for that dignity and well being. God always loves both the chosen and the outcast. So I ask this morning, why does there have to even be an outcast in our society? In God's eyes, everyone, every group, every nation is chosen by his love. Perhaps that may sound too utopian for some of you, but I think it's really the answer to the conflicts that keep tearing our lives and our world apart. Sam Sinegar, student of Colorado College, says that it's time for us as a nation, as a united people, to develop a culture that seeks to change the world through not just spiritual realization, but through adjusting unjust systems that maintain oppression and thus a sense of being enslaved, which can leave the problematic ideals in place. The indigenous peoples of our land are rooted in their native spirituality and culture, desiring to be expressed in the ideal and deep values of equality for all of creation and respect of all life. Indigenous religions contain the ideals that cr can create a truly just society. And so we must ask ourselves, how can it be used to create a desired reality? One important aspect is simply the revival and survival of American Indian culture, which has been viciously attacked by genocide, missionaries, Western education of natives, adopting away Indian children, encouragement of urbanization, the media, and many other governmental and cultural factors. And so we see and hear a similar call from the Black American peoples, as well as the indigenous natives of our country. 
Our belief that some things ought not to happen really needs to be grounded in the belief that we live in the presence of God. Our treatment of the earth and mankind somehow has to take into consideration a belief that all of God's creation is perfect and all persons are of value and not just things to be treated as we choose. If there is a living God before whom we all live our lives, there is a living source of guidance and moral truth. If there is a living God, we must all live responsibly and hold ourselves and each other accountable to the care and protection of the earth and mankind. These are the truths that Jesus taught. These are the truths that God willed when he set this world in motion. Earlier in this biblical text, the angel of the Lord told Hagar that God heard of her misery but that she was to return to Sarah and Abraham to try to work things out. And despite Sarah and Abraham's lack of trusting faith, God did bless them in their old age by fulfilling his promise to them. And when Hagar and Ishmael were thrown away as outcasts, God was there and led them to safety and made provision for them. Jesus said that we are to learn to love everybody just as God loves everybody. We are called to love both the Ishmaels and the Isaacs in every situation, even the situations in which we can clearly identify ourselves with one or the other. We are called to want what is best for both and to want peace and justice between them. Can we be more courageous than Abraham was? Can we refuse to go along with those who seem to be insisting upon the rejection of either the outcast or the chosen? Can we find ways of putting creative love to work in situations of conflict? Can we find ways of becoming peacemakers? When people can begin to think and act in these ways, it can make a very real difference. Senator also said, <clears throat> when we have developed an understanding of unity, that will help us make decisions with the value of all creation in mind. We must be able to see the forest of oppression through the trees of good intentions. It is our job to learn and teach the values that our society desperately needs, but to do so in a way that does not harm. What would it take for these things to happen? For some, it would require a real conversion. When we're caught up in the conflict, it's hard to see anything in any way except from our own perspective. And sadly, Many have long since stopped living with any real consciousness of God. But conversions can happen. Paul in the book of Romans spoke of dying to sin and being raised to a new life in Christ. By the grace of God, we can die to fear and jealousy and hate and greed, and we can be raised to a new life shaped by trust and faith and love. We can become more conscious and aware of God's presence in all situations. Let us pray for that kind of conversion for ourselves and for all people here in our own nation, as well as in the community of nations. We all need that because there are some things that just ought not to happen in our world. Let us pray. Lord God, here in this place and time, you have chosen to be with us. Everywhere we turn, you are there, ready to receive us and give us direction. We turn to the south from which the warm winds blow, and your spirit warms us, giving us life. We turn to the west, to the place of discovery and the unknown, 
and your certainty awaits us. We turn to the north, the place of seeking and knowing, and find your wisdom is already there. Around us, before us, and behind us, your presence is here. We open our arms and our hearts so that we, you may come inside. We pray that you see we are a good place for you to live. We pray that we as your children might respond to your love and mercy in ways that are pleasing to you. And that we live life so that it demonstrates that you are our God. And our gratitude for all that you are all that you have been and all that we are promised, we gather as one congregation among many to lift our voices in praise and song, to lift up our hearts in appreciation and prayer, trusting that you are already working to relieve our concerns and meeting the needs of all your children. Lord of all, continue to bless us with the strength and the courage to live the way of life that Jesus has called us to. Gather the nations into your great sanctuary. Live in us and help us to be your humble servants in this world of great need for so many, many things, especially for understanding and unity. Let us be a bright light to shine as a beacon for you, Holy One. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Perfect Peace, Peace, Perfect Peace. Please join us. May the presence of God be an active presence in all of our living. And may you feel the Lord God close to you, bidding and chiding you to greet, greet the conflicts in your world with love and patience and kindness. Into our hands, God gives strength and worth. Trust that this wild world is full of God's steadfast love. For you, dear servants, were made for this love. Go forth in this deep peace.
Amen. Thank you, Janice and Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You've got it. If you got a jazz.